Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global Immunotalks. It's my pleasure today. My name is Asia Rolls, and I will be introducing today Tiffany Rizzi, who is uh, and uh, maybe just a few words of introduction about uh, this uh, Global Immunotalks. Uh, this is a special series that's supposed to allow us actually to expose uh, the best immunologists to everyone around the world. Uh, it was started by Alina and Carla, and uh, it's running for several years now. And today, it's a special uh, privilege for me to introduce Tiffany. And Tiffany is working on basic aspects of immunology. I think uh, her postdoc work was uh, based on, she discovered how helmet infections can actually induce herpes virus reactivation and how these pro all processes are connected. And since 2015, she's been appointed as assistant professor and she's working on how the immune system regulates and actually responds to viral infections and chronic infections and how they cope with a second challenge uh, when, it, uh, when it comes. She, I, I assume she will be talking about that a lot today. And she, she won the Pew Fellowship. And also, uh, I think this is a good opportunity to say that she was just uh, approved as the tenure and it's, it's, very, it's great uh, that we can celebrate it with you today. And for that, you got an extra question. So as you know, uh, <laughs> this series, uh, we ask a personal question, something that kind of can be also educational for uh, the students and the postdocs in the, in the audience. So we usually ask one, but today Taf Tiffany got an opportunity to be asked to. So first I would like to ask you, could you share one of the most impactful, impactful decisions in your scientific career? Okay, well, thanks, Asha. Um, I guess one of the most impactful decisions for me um, was, you know, choosing a mentor and particularly a mentor for my postdoctoral fellowship that um, was really going to sponsor and support my career. So for, you know, for me, the choice to go into academia, you know, I think having that sort of mentor that was really going to advocate for me and, um, and support me ended up being a really important decision. I think it's a critical decision that we don't even estimate it in the beginning. And uh, I'm really glad that you're highlighting that. And maybe the second question is, what do you think is your personality trait, trait that helped you the most in your scientific career? Um, yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, there are always, you know, really stressful moments, you know, in, in our career or in science. And, um, you know, of course, you have to have your, you know, moment to freak out or get upset or, you know, all those things. But I think uh, one of my skills is probably an ability to, after I have that moment, uh, sort of block out the noise and just focus on what it is I have to do to get through it. So, um, yeah, you know, making the list, just checking every little thing off and, you know, making progress. So I think, yeah, my ability to kind of shut out that noise, the the things that make you doubt whether you can do it or not is probably my my strength. It's a very, it's a very good advice and a very good point. So um, thank you very much. And uh, then maybe let's go straight to the talk. Uh, oh. Just to remind everyone, this is kind of, there's some kind of abrupt ending in the end. So there is no way you cannot ask the questions uh, on live. But you, uh, as we go along, I will, uh, and I will also share, share it, you can do it on X and uh, we will give you the handle and you can ask all your questions there and Tiffany will be available to address them throughout the next days. Okay. So Tiffany, please, the stage is okay. yours. All right, so just making sure that you are seeing the correct screen. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the title of my talk today is Viral and Parasitic Manipulations of the Host. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's quite an honor to be selected um, to give one of these talks. So um, I'll start off and first of all, just acknowledge my lab, 
from the very beginning um, at UT Southwestern. Um, I have a great group of people that are listed here and a great group of collaborators. Um, the two stories, I'm gonna talk actually about two different stories. Uh, that I, and the ones that I'm going to talk about um, are particularly stories from um, a former graduate student in the lab, Christina Zarek, as well as a current postdoc in the lab, Guishen Wong. So I'm going to start off talking about some of Christina's work and, and our co-infection work, and then about halfway through, uh, it might be a little bit of an abrupt change, but I'm going to shift gears and talk about Guishen's work. So um, the, you know, the foundation really for a lot of our co-infection studies um, is that, you know, humans have a really diverse and uh, varied infection history. And, you know, every individual here is um, infected with eight to 12 different chronic viral infections at any given time. We all harbor billions of bacterial infections and a large percentage of the world's population also is chronically infected with um, different types of helminths. So, you know, the human immune response is constantly being shaped by these different chronic infections. And in particular, you know, this graph here is showing uh, the prevalence of certain types of chronic infections in the human uh, population. And in particular, the red arrows are highlighting herpes viruses. So one of my favorite viruses is herpes viruses. And, and I think they're really interesting viruses for trying to understand how chronic infection alters immune responses. Um, oops, a number of years ago now, there we go, um, we asked the question of whether presence of chronic infections could alter immune response to vaccination. And so we decided to take mice that were either raised in a very clean facility, so an SPF mouse, and compare that with mice that were infected with a series of different infections starting relatively early in life, so starting at weaning. And so we infected mice with two different chronic herpes virus infections as well as um, an, uh, a respiratory infection flu, and then the intestinal parasite infection, H. polygyrus. We allowed these infections to either resolve or become chronic, and then we challenged both the SPF mice as well as the co-infected or sequentially infected mice with a vaccine, a yellow fever virus vaccine. And uh, we compare gene expression profiles first of all, even before the vaccine challenge. And not surprisingly, if you just look in the blood, the gene expression profiles in the mice that have co-infections versus don't have co-infections, it's very different. And the mice that have co-infections had this um, interferon metagene um, in their sequencing analysis. And we um, were doing this at the same time as um, the Massapus group was studying pet store or um, wild mice. And so um, similar to them, we compared our gene expression profiles with human gene expression profiles. And in particular, adult humans versus uh, neonate or cord blood gene expression profiles. And what we found was that similar to the Massapus group's pet store mice, our co-infected mice had gene expression profiles and this type one interferon response metagene that most closely mimicked the adult human gene expression profiles. Whereas SPF mice that harbored no or no chronic infections that we gave them, they had a gene expression profile that more closely mimicked the neonate or cord blood gene expression profile in humans. So we think, we thought at the time, and we still do, that what this really suggests is that barrier-raised mice that are kept in very clean facilities have very immature gene expression profiles um, and perhaps very immature response to vaccination, more similar to um, a human neonate. But if you can take mice and expose them to a series of uh, viruses, maybe even bacteria, although we didn't particularly test that in this scenario, and parasites, we may be able to mature the immune response of these animals and, and ultimately alter their response to vaccination, perhaps in a way that more closely mimics what happens to humans. Um, so, you know, this question of, you know, how do chronic infections mature immune systems and, and change really how um, 
in, in our case, mice respond to infections is, is a primary interest in my lab. And we think that there are defined chronic and, and maybe specific or small numbers of co-infecting pathogens in mice that may be able to recapitulate aspects of the human immune response. And we think our data has suggested that really basal immune activation in, um, in our case, animals or in humans is dictated perhaps by the presence of bystander chronic infections. But I think there's a lot of questions that we really don't understand. And that is, what are these basal chronic or bystander chronic infections doing to really alter basal immune activation? And is there some sort of defined or minimal number of chronic infections that we can use to alter immune response um, in mice to vaccination, pathogen challenge, perhaps even tumor challenge? And so those are questions that um, kind of overall I'm interested in addressing in my lab. Um, but, you know, when I started my lab initially, we had to be, you know, pretty focused as far as what we were able to do. And as Asya mentioned, I've been really interested just in particular in two different types of chronic infections, and that's herpes viruses and helminths. And um, we found that if we took mice that harbored a chronic latent herpes virus infection and then challenged them with an intestinal parasite, H. polygyrus, which I'll, I'll introduce in, in the coming slides, we could induce reactivation of murine gamma herpes virus 68. And, and you know, this is just an, an image showing that if you use a luciferase tagged virus in these co-infected animals, you get virus reactivation. And this is sort of a transient um, STAT6 dependent reactivation. But this system, I think, provides us with really tractable models to um, manipulate and understand how two very different infections um, in the same host can have profound impacts on um, the immune response to those pathogens as well as the basal immune activation. And so we wanted to continue to manipulate this particular system um, and even just reverse the order of co-infections and see if we could learn something new or different about uh, what was happening to herpes virus reactivation from latency, as well as what was happening to the basal immune state. And so um, this was a project that was taken on by my graduate student in the lab, Christina Zarek. So one of the main reasons, though, that we were interested also in continuing to study this system is that we knew that both of these infections have really interesting and profound effects on macrophage populations. Um, and so just to introduce the macrophages that I'll be talking about today that are being altered by both of these infections, um, you know, we look primarily in the peritoneal cavity. And um, the macrophage populations in the peritoneal cavity are mainly composed of two different types of macrophages. There are the large peritoneal macrophages and the small peritoneal macrophages. The large peritoneal macrophages are yolk sac derived. These are considered the resident, uh, tissue resident macrophages. They are locally self-renewing um, and it's been shown by others that their um, proliferation can be driven by IL-4 as well as CSF-1. Now, on the other hand, the small peritoneal macrophages are the ones that are, are generated from a hematopoietic progenitor. These are typically the more inflammatory blood monocyte recruited macrophages. So these are the ones that get recruited into the tissue upon um, an inflammatory stimulus. And so, you know, work by others has really shown that in particular, large peritoneal macrophages can be altered by helminth infections. So multiple different helminth infection models that infect different tissues have all been shown to cause expansion of these large peritoneal macrophages. But on the other hand, murine gamma herpes virus 68, which is our model gamma herpes virus infection that I'll introduce in, in two slides, is um, capable of infecting those particular cells. So we were interested about how um, these two infections together would modulate this population of macrophages. So the models that we use are um, first our intestinal parasite, which is Hologmosomoides polygyrus. This is endemic to wild mice, um, and it's transmitted by the fecal oral route. Um, this particular parasite will establish a chronic infection in, in our standard black six mice. 
Um, and it, we know that it causes expansion of tissue resident macrophages. Murine gamma herpes virus 68 or MHV 68 is a model for the human viruses, Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus and Epstein Barr virus in mice. So the murine gamma herpes virus 68 model, similar to all other herpes viruses, will um, undergo initially an acute infection, and then it will establish chronic infection. And chronic infection is uh, typically latent or quiescent. However, the chronic infection will re, uh, reactivate periodically when the immune system has been perturbed. So we know that the immune system is really critical for maintaining viral latency and preventing virus reactivation. But we also know that when the immune system is perturbed, perhaps by a parasite infection or other stress stimuli that you can um, induce herpes viruses to reactivate from latency. And so these particular herpes viruses infect cells of the immune system. So in particular, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And this, so, but what we're interested in today really are the macrophage infections. And it was shown by um, Linda Van Dyke's group a couple of years ago, that if you took um, mice and you infected them with murine gamma herpes virus 68 using a tagged version of the virus so that you could uh, look at viral infection by flow cytometry, and you look just one day after viral infection, so very early on in the peritoneal cavity, what you see is that yes, the virus does infect B cells and dendritic cells, as well as a monocyte population, but where you really see a really robust infection very early on is these large peritoneal tissue resident macrophages. And so, um, as I mentioned, you know, it's been shown by others that tissue resident macrophages or large peritoneal macrophages can be expanded by intestinal parasite infection. And so we've, we confirmed that finding ourselves. If we infect mice with um, H. polygyrus, what we see is that by seven days and, and definitely by 14 days, we have a large expansion of this large peritoneal macrophage population. On the other hand, though, virus, as I said, likes to infect these macrophages, and it also causes what's been termed by you know, others as the macrophage disappearance reaction. So if you just look in the peritoneal cavity after viral infection, and here we're looking um, particularly at day four, you see that um, mice that have been infected with the virus have uh, many fewer large peritoneal macrophages. And yes, some of this could be because the virus replicated and maybe caused some of those cells to die, but we don't think that the proportion of, of infection is actually high enough to account for this full disappearance. So there are signals ultimately that cause macrophage disappearance after it could be virus or bacteria, but this suggests that there's really, you know, uh, both these infections are modulating these macrophage populations in very different ways. So what happens if you combine the two infections together? And so our model again was that we would first now infect with intestinal parasite and seven days later challenge with gamma herpes virus 68 and look by flow cytometry at macrophages in the peritoneal cavity. And interestingly, what we saw was that first, if we look at the amount of virus that's infecting in the peritoneal cavity, we see that actually there's a huge expansion of virus infection in the mice that harbor both infections relative to mice that are only infected with the virus. Um, and this starts to occur really early on, but it persists even seven days after infection. And notably, this virus is actually primarily infecting these large peritoneal macrophages. So here um, we're looking for virus infection in particularly the large peritoneal macrophages. And you see that in red, the co-infected animals have much more viral infection. And that is seem, does seem to be very specific to the large peritoneal macrophages, because if you look at the small peritoneal macrophages, there's really not much difference. And in fact, even at day four, there may in fact be less um, herpes virus infection in the small peritoneal macrophages. Um, so now we see that you know, the presence of parasite infection is causing increased infection in gamma herpes virus 68, and particularly in these large peritoneal macrophages. Does the increased infection though, that we're seeing here overall really require the presence of these macrophages or the expansion of these macrophages? 
So in order to um, get at whether large peritoneal macrophages um, and the expansion of large peritoneal macrophages were required for the effects we were seeing with intestinal parasite infection, we took advantage of um, a model where if you delete GATA6, particularly in macrophages, you can reduce or um, get rid of the large peritoneal macrophages. And, and that's because GATA6 is responsive to retinoic acid, and retinoic acid is a key factor for driving gene expression um, in large peritoneal macrophages. Um, so if we use these mice and we infect either um, here on the right-hand side, the mice that are deleted in GATA6 versus the mice that are sufficient in GATA6, you can see that there is a reduction in the large peritoneal macrophage population in the mice that are deleted in GATA6, although they are not completely gone, particularly if they are uh, parasite co-infected. However, if we look at the amount of virus, we can see that viral infection is significantly reduced when mice are depleted of the large peritoneal macrophages. And in fact, the parasite infection can no longer enhance viral infection when there are no large peritoneal macrophages or they're significantly reduced. Um, so everything I've shown so far is, um, you know, just viral infection. We're not measuring whether that virus is actually replicating. And so at one point we decided we needed to measure virus replication, particularly in the um, per peritoneal cavity. And so that's what we did. We measured viral replication in peritoneal lavage fluid. And interestingly, what you see is that actually viral replication is not significantly changed by uh, parasite co-infection. There's a small difference here at day two, but it quickly normalizes by day four and by day seven. So this suggests that parasite infection isn't necessarily increasing virus replication. It may be increasing infection, which may have implications for viral latency and reactivation, but doesn't necessarily increase virus replication at acute time points. Um, so what happens then to viral latency. Um, we see that there's increased infection, but not increased replication during acute time points. But if we go out to these time points that we consider latent time points, so approximately a month after virus infection, what's going on with the virus? And what we see is that in the co-infected animals, we still have an increase in virus infection. So here in this flow plot are just um, mice that only have virus. And in this flow plot, you can see mice that have both helminth and virus, and there is in fact more viral infection. And it's particularly in, again, these large peritoneal macrophages and not the small peritoneal, or yeah, the small peritoneal macrophages or the B cells. Um, so again, does this really require the large peritoneal macrophage expansion? And um, in these experiments, we took an alternate approach um, to the genetic approach in order to de deplete mice of these large peritoneal macrophages. Uh, we actually used a vitamin A deficient model. And that's because, as I mentioned, large peritoneal macrophages are really dependent um, on retinoic acid signaling and the induction of GATA6 downstream of retinoic acid signaling. So if you can deplete mice of retinoic acid, uh, which is derived from dietary vitamin A, you can also deplete them of large peritoneal macrophages. So in this case, you have to breed mice on a either control diet or a vitamin A deficient diet, um, and then raise them on their respective diets. So again, we set up our co-infection model, and this time we looked at our latency time point. And again, we see that the uh, viral infection um, and the increase in virus infection during co-infection really requires uh, these large peritoneal macrophages. So in the vitamin A deficient mice over here in the green bar that are co-infected, we now no longer have a significant expansion of large peritoneal macrophages and we no longer have a significant expansion of viral infection. So, um, really the biology of herpes viruses isn't so much infection, it's really reactivation. So what now happens during co-infection if we uh, look at virus reactivation from latency? And this was actually a very striking result. So 
Um, if mice are infected in the blue line with only herpes virus, you get about one in 10,000 cells that will reactivate from latency in a normal animal. However, if the mice are um, latently infected with or chronically infected with the intestinal parasite and latently infected with gamma herpes virus 68, we now see a more than tenfold increase in virus reactivation from latency. And in this particular assay, we take cells out of the peritoneal cavity, and then we do this reactivation assay ex vivo to measure the ability of those cells to reactivate. And so this is actually measuring the propensity of the virus to reactivate. And so this data actually suggests, because this will happen anytime you take the cells out of the animal and, and induce this reactivation, that actually the presence of parasite co-infection is increasing the ability of these cells to reactivate from latency. Um, and again, does this require large peritoneal macrophages and, um, and particularly vitamin A? So we used, again, our vitamin A deficient model. And what we see is that um, in the black and the green are the vitamin A deficient mice uh, that, you know, normally latency and reactivation um, in mice that are only harboring the virus is relatively normal um, comparing the control diet and the bad diet mice. And now if we look at what happens in the VAD diet mice with H. polygyrus and MHV68 co-infection, you see that now there is still maybe a small increase in virus reactivation, but it's much less than in the control diet mice, suggesting that um, the increased reactivation from latency induced by parasite co-infection requires uh, dietary vitamin A and retinoic acid signaling. So, um, you know, we, we've known from my previous work that parasites can increase MHV68 reactivation. That's not necessarily surprising, but I think what I'd like to highlight is that the mechanisms that I've detailed today compared with what we've previously shown are really different, and it's based on the order of infection. So what I, um, you know, detailed now, almost, well, 10 years ago, really, was that if you first had virus infection and then you challenged with parasite, you could induce virus reactivation from latency shown down here. And importantly, I also showed that this really requires STAT6 and IL-4 signaling. Um, and uh, this, yeah, so the reactivation required IL-4 signaling. So if we did the same experiment in mice that were deficient in STAT-6, we could no longer induce herpes virus reactivation with intestinal parasite infection. Now, what I've just described to you in the last few minutes has been that uh, this virus reactivation from latency induced by pre-infection with intestinal helminth, so we've now reversed the order of infection, is requiring large peritoneal macrophages and retinoic acid signaling. And so just to confirm, we did experiments in STAT6 knockout mice again using this particular order of infection. And notably, what you see is that in the STAT6 knockout mice, there is still increased virus reactivation during co-infection. So this data suggests that um, the mechanism of reactivation for the virus can depend on the order of infection. So if the parasite is there first, it may still increase virus reactivation, but it's gonna do it differently than if the parasite is there second. But I think there's a lot of other interesting implications from this study that we're um, still following up on. Um, so this intestinal parasite, so this parasite is restricted exclusively to the intestine, but it has the ability to systemically alter macrophage populations. And in data I didn't show you, it appears that this really is retinoic acid dependent. And we see that intestinal parasite is expanding these large peritoneal macrophages in a retinoic acid dependent manner and increasing their retinoic acid metabolism. And in the context of a co-infection scenario, and in, in particular co-infection with this herpes virus, we see that this expanded large peritoneal macrophage population can increase viral infection, latency, as well as reactivation. And importantly, I think uh, what we also see is that the Helminth infection is actually buffering or preventing the macrophage disappearance reaction. And so this, I think, you know, can suggest that 
um, intestinal parasites, in this case, this intestinal helminth, may have the ability to promote either disease tolerance or disease susceptibility in other organs through modulating tissue resident macrophages. And, you know, we know that intestinal parasites have these amazing sort of systemic effects on immunity. They can um, you know, inhibit allergy and autoimmunity, but they can also uh, reduce vaccine efficacy and impair control um, with different viral infections. And so, you know, an ongoing interest for us in the future is really understanding how the intestinal parasites are altering these tissue resident macrophages and then altering their response to viral infections. So normally now I would stop and take questions from this half, but since we're um, doing this um, over Zoom like this, um, I'm going to go ahead and segue into the next story, which is actually pretty different. This is much more of a virology and cell biology story from my lab. So um, we became interested in this concept of how viruses adapt or co-opt mechanisms in their host and how hosts, you know, develop counter defense strategies. We often think about this as an evolutionary arms race, right? So viruses evolve ways to promote their pathogenesis. In the case of herpes viruses, one mechanism might be latency. And then, of course, um, you know, humans or, or mice, animals will evolve ways to defend against these viral viruses. Um, in the focus of this half of the talk, though, what I'm really focusing on are this idea of viral mimics, so viruses stealing important host proteins and evolving them to promote their viral replication or their pathogenesis. And then, of course, how the um, host evolves defense strategies. And you'll note that I put cell death or program cell death down here as a defense strategy. And I think that's because we often think of cell death as being um, a way of the host for the host to defend against viral infections. But what I hope to convince you about today is that in fact, cell death can often be pro-viral. And so it doesn't always belong down here as a defense strategy. And so the project today I'm gonna to talk about was led by um, a really talented postdoc in my lab, Guishen Wong. And we did all of this work in collaboration with um, two other members of the faculty here at UT Southwestern. Uh, Dustin Hanks, as well as Rob Orchard. So viral replication um, at its most basic description is a process where the virus has to enter the cell. It has to replicate its viral genome and transcribe and translate viral genes. It then has to assemble new viruses and then it has to egress or get out of the cell. And we typically divide egress into two different categories. It can either be lytic or non-lytic. But in the case of lytic, egress is actually requires the cell to lyse or die in order for the virus to get out of the cell. And so we became interested in this process of how viruses might induce cell death to promote viral egress. Um, so the virus system that I'm gonna talk about today is noroviruses. And we know that this vir these viruses can cause uh, lysis or cell death, particularly of macrophages. So noroviruses are members of the Caliciviridae family. They cause um, the vast majority of epidemic non-bacterial gastroenteritis in the world. They're transmitted by the fecal oral route, typically from contaminated food and water sources. And um, the model system we use is murine norovirus. And this really is a model for human norovirus. So unfortunately, the human viruses are much more difficult to work with in cell culture, and they don't infect animals. But the murine norovirus system has a really robust tissue culture system and a robust animal model. And as I mentioned, MNV will cause lysis of macrophages in tissue culture. And it's also been reported to induce exosomal release of virus. So we in fact do see that if we infect macrophages, either macrophage cell lines or what I'm showing you here are bone marrow derived macrophages with murine norovirus that we induce a lytic rupture of the plasma membrane. So um, we use two different strains of norovirus. The differences in those strains for the purpose of this talk is not um, important. One is called CR6 and one is called CW3. So we use them both in almost all of our experiments. Um, and what you see is if you measure cell viability after norovirus infection, the cells uh, very rapidly die, as you would expect, and they induce 
rupture of the plasma membrane as measured by LDH release. And notably, um, others have reported, and we also see, that if you infect cells with either strain of norovirus and look at cleavage of gasdermin D or cleavage of caspase 3, you see that both viruses induce um, these, you know, uh, activation of these different cell death pathways. And so it's been assumed, I think, for a while that, oh, noroviruses probably induce apoptosis. However, when we really tried to interrogate whether any classic programmed cell death pathways or genes were required for norovirus to induce cell death, we were unable to identify any that were required. So I'm summarizing a ton of data here. It's all it was all negative, but Guishan made... Um, so many CRISPR knockouts, knocking out individual genes, as well as combinations of genes in apoptosis, necroptosis, and pyroptosis pathways. And he used knockouts along with inhibitors and ultimately was not able to show that any of them were required for norovirus to induce cell death. The only thing he could find that was actually required was ninjurin one or NINJ1. And so this, uh, protein was identified a couple of years ago by the Dixit group, and it was shown to be a plasma membrane protein that is potentially essential for the final rupture of the plasma membrane downstream of multiple different cell death cascades, including apoptosis, pyroptosis, and necroptosis. So when Guishan generated cells that were knocked out of Ninjurin 1 and infected them with norovirus, what he saw was that the cells actually still died as measured by ATP. And you can see that here, the ninjurin one knockout cells with norovirus infection are dead. However, they don't rupture the plasma membrane. And um, I don't know if you can see on the slides here, but you see that the plasma membrane swells and gets really big, but it stays intact. And importantly, if you look at viral replication in these cells, what you see is that if you look just at intracellular virus, which is down here at the bottom and quantitate that, the virus replicates uh, equivalent amounts of viral genome and um, equivalent amounts of virus within the cell. But if you look at the amount of virus that gets out of the cell, the ninjurin one knockout cells are really defective. So this data suggests that it's the rupture of the plasma membrane is important for efficient virus replication, but how ninjurin 1 ultimately gets activated, we, we don't know because none of the upstream genes seem to be required. So this led us to ask whether there was a norovirus gene that might actually be responsible for inducing a cell death cascade. So noroviruses are small RNA viruses, so we were able to just individually take each um, of the norovirus genes and overexpress those in cells. And so overexpressing these individually in 293T cells, you see that one particular viral gene called NS3 is toxic ultimately to cells. What is NS3? Well, NS3 is known to be the NTPase of norovirus. It has RNA helicase activity. Um, so that means it's um, important for unwinding the viral RNA and it's really essential for viral replication. Um, these, that, those functions are encoded by the core in the C-terminal domain depicted here in this predicted structure in red and blue. But um, norovirus uh, NS3 also encodes this additional domain, the N-terminal domain, which is depicted here in green, which had no known function. So we first asked which domain of this protein might be um, uh, sufficient or necessary to cause cell death. So using now an inducible system where we either overexpress and induce full length NS3 and terminal domain of NS3 or the C terminal and core domain of NS3, what you see is that the N terminal domain is both necessary and sufficient to induce cell death in macrophages, whereas the C terminal domain has no toxicity. Now, Guishan um, sort of immediately realized that this N-terminal domain was really interesting. And that's because the N-terminal domain is predicted to have a four helical bundle structure. And he noted that that was reminiscent of a host protein, actually MLKL. And here's the structure of mouse MLKL. And you see in purple, again, the MLKL has a predicted four helix bundle domain. What's MLKL? Um, well, MLKL is this terminal effector protein um, in necroptosis. So 
Um, MLKL gets uh, phosphorylated by RIPK3 downstream of necroptotic signals. It will then undergo a conformational change, oligomerize and insert um, in membranes or maybe the plasma membrane to induce pore formation and membrane disruption. So it's considered the executioner of necroptosis. So we started to wonder if it was possible that our norovirus protein was mimicking MLKL. And so this is when we collaborated with Dustin Hanks in our department, because Dustin Hanks is really an expert on uh, viral evolution and this idea that viruses are always stealing proteins from their hosts. Um, and he had actually shown, as well as other groups, that um, MLKL is, has been mimicked before. And in fact, pox viruses like myxoma virus have mimics of the kinase domain of MLKL, and they actually express dominant negative versions of this. So they're trying to inhibit necroptosis. But we speculated that maybe noroviruses were mimicking this four helical bundle domain and actually mimicking it to um, induce cell death. So um, Dustin did alignments of 34 different human and plant MLKL for helix bundle domain sequences, along with 31 different Khaleesi virus sequences, and was able to find that there's evidence of sequence conservation. Importantly, when he did all these, he had to trim off the first 20 or so amino acids. And that's because when he threaded the predicted uh, the viral gene through um, prediction programs, these first 20 amino acids were predicted to have a mitochondrial localization signal, which is actually very different than MLKL. But it gave us a clue as to what this viral mimic might be doing. So we next asked where it localized in the cell. And so if we overexpress C, N, or full length of NS3, and then isolate either the cytoplasm or the mitochondria. What we see is that the C-terminal domain localizes primarily to the cytoplasmic fraction of cells, but the N-terminal domain and the full-length domain really seem to um, localize primarily to the mitochondrial fraction. And in fact, if we make recombinant proteins and ask what types of lipids do they bind to, what we see is that N-terminal and full-length proteins really bind to PA, PS, and cardiolipin, whereas the C-terminal um, domain doesn't seem to have any affinity, uh, particularly for any of these lipids. So the binding to cardiolipin and the localization to mitochondria suggests that perhaps NS3 is targeting mitochondria. So we asked whether recombinant protein um, of NS3 could cause uh, disruption of liposomes composed of either cardiolipin or lipids that mimic the outer mitochondrial membrane. So depicted here is OMM. And what you can see is that if these liposomes are incubated with either full-length recombinant NS3 or just the N-terminal domain of NS3, we get complete disruption of these liposomes. Whereas the C-terminal domain uh, by itself does not cause any disruption of these liposomes. We can also take recombinant protein and incubate it with purified mitochondria. And when we do that, what we see is that both the N-terminal domain um, and the full-length protein can induce uh, release of cytochrome C from purified mitochondria, suggesting that it's disrupting mitochondria. So um, we think the NS3 in terminal domain has evolved a unique signal to specifically target mitochondria and cause mitochondrial disruption. And so we show that it localizes to mitochondria, permeabilizes uh, liposomes that mimic mitochondria, cause release of cytochrome C from mitochondria, and in data I didn't show, we think there's evidence that it actually forms a size selective pore. So if you make liposomes with large dyes versus small dyes, the really large dyes can't get out, but the smaller ones can, suggesting it might be a, a size selective pore. Um, and importantly, we also showed that NS3 and terminal domain overexpression leads to depolarization of mitochondria, leading to increases in reactive oxygen species, caspase 3 cleavage, and of course, gas and D cleavage. And that was data I didn't have time to show. Um, so, you know, further evidence that NS3 actually may oligomerize or form filaments. We're currently, this is just really a work in progress, but we would like um, to show potentially a structure for NS3 and maybe even a structure for an NS3 pore. But here we're just doing negative staining EM of recombinant NS3. And you can see that it does in fact seem to form long filaments suggesting that it oligomerizes at which you no longer see those if you've incubated with detergents. So this is really a work in progress, but it really I think supports the idea that NS3 can oligomerize.
But what happens um, with NS3 in the context of viral infection and replication? So we made viruses of nor uh, Miri norovirus that are deleted in the, the N-terminal domain. And um, we also made mutant viruses not shown here that are deleted only in that mitochondrial localization signal. But um, all the results were the same between the two different sets of viruses. So here's just showing the viruses that are deleted in either strain, CR6 or CW3, of the entire N-terminal domain. And first, we looked at cell viability. And what you can see is that compared with wild type, these two viruses no longer cause cell death after viral infection. But what happens to egress? Can these viruses get out of the cell? So when we infect um, cells with these viruses, and then we measure the amount of genome that replicates within the cell, we see that both um, wild type virus and N-terminal domain deletion virus replicate equivalently. So this suggests that um, we have not disrupted the ability of uh, NS3 to perform its, you know, important functions in viral replication. But what we have disrupted is its ability to get out of the cell. So if we now look at the amount of virus that is released into the supernatant, what we see is that these two mutant viruses that are deleted in the N-terminal domain are completely defective in their ability to get out of the cell. Um, but, you know, one caveat to these experiments is that we had to measure genome copies in order to quantitate the amount of virus. And that's because if a virus doesn't lyse the cell, you can't do a conventional plaque assay. And so uh, this is an immunology talk, so um, there may not be as many virologists in the audience, but virologists uh, you know, would really like to see a plaque assay. We can't do that here, but we did devise a system to um, bypass essentially the need for egress. So we're calling this our egress bypass assay. And what we wanna do is validate that um, this defect in, in what we think is egress is not actually a defect in viral assembly. So it's still theoretically possible, right? That you replicate the viral genome, but then somehow it doesn't assemble into a functional virus. Um, so the way to um, exclude that possibility is through this egress bypass assay. So what we do is we infect with our mutant virus into our macrophage cell lines. We wait 24 hours. And when we collect the cell associated virus, we basically force release of that virus through freeze thaw. So if you repeatedly freeze thaw the cells, you mechanically rupture the plasma membrane. And then we can take that freeze thawed virus infect new cells and then measure how much virus replication we get. And what this really will test is whether this virus that we've mechanically released from the cell is still able to infect new cells. And what we see is that in fact, it can. So this data really suggests that the defect in our, our deletion mutant viruses is truly an egress defect and not necessarily an assembly defect. But importantly, does this um, deletion in the virus impact the ability of the virus to replicate in mice? And so here I'm just showing you um, infection with um, our deletion viruses, particularly in the CR6 strain, which replicates really well in intestinal tissue and is excreted in the feces. And so of course we get good replication in wild type in mice infected with wild type virus, but we really see that the N-terminal deletion virus is completely a defective in viral replication, and it can't replicate at all in vivo. The same was true, actually, if we used the other strain of virus, CW3, and it was also true if we used deletion viruses that are only deleted in the mitochondrial localization signal. So what I hope I've convinced you with in the second half of the talk is that viruses may actually sometimes steal death-inducing proteins from their hosts as a mechanism to actually promote viral egress. And in this case, inducing these death cascades of, um, may actually be proviral. Um, we think the protein that we've identified, this NS3 and terminal domain, forms a four helical bundle domain and mimics MLKL in order to um, induce a pore actually in mitochondria and induce cytochrome C release. Of course, once this happens, you probably induce multiple different death cascades. Um, but we also show that um, this N-terminal domain is really required for MNV to induce cell death, lead to viral egress and pathogenesis in vivo. So there's a lot of different avenues that we're going from here. Um, but one question that we have that really interests us is how 
how is NS3 regulated in terms of its targeting of mitochondria? So as you may have noted, you know, we said our data suggests that maybe NS3 is targeting particularly cardiolipin or binding cardiolipin, but mitochondria under steady state have low cardiolipin on the outer mitochondrial membrane and actually have much higher levels of cardiolipin on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So how would NS3 access cardiolipin? And so Guashan asked whether norovirus infection could actually induce the externalization of cardiolipin. And so um, what he did was to measure cardiolipin externalization on purified mitochondria. And if you look in mock cells, so, you know, mitochondria isolated from uninfected cells, cardiolipin levels are low, but if those cells become stressed with either STS as a positive control, or they've been infected with either strain of norovirus, you get externalization of cardiolipin. So now we think it's possible that the viral infection is actually inducing this cardiolipin externalization, which then allows NS3 to target it. Um, and importantly, we asked whether, you know, if we um, interrupted the ability of macrophages to externalize cardiolipin. So if we deleted this flipase, called PLSCR3, um, would um, uh, NS3 still be able to induce uh, cell death? So we made PLSCR3 knockout cells and infected them with norovirus. And what you see is now um, the virally infected cells that are knocked out in PLSCR3, so they don't externalize cardiolipin, um, are now defective in cell death and they are defective in viral replication. So we think this really suggests that the regulation of cardiolipin is an important step in regulating how NS3 or when NS3 mm -hmm. induces uh, virus uh, cell death for viral egress. But, you know, I think another really interesting question is, you know, do other viruses have a similar mechanism for viral or RNA virus egress? And so this is just very preliminary data, but um, we are interested in, in further looking at how cardiolipin externalization may be um, an area in which a lot of viruses converge evolutionarily um, on as a way to promote cell death for viral egress. So um, we just took viruses that we had in the freezer so um, a couple of different DNA viruses infected either wild type or PLSCR3 knockout cells and just measured total virus replication. And you can see the DNA viruses, it really doesn't matter. They don't care if the cells are wild type or knocked out of PLSCR3. However, if we take these very different RNA viruses um, that all have very different ways of replicating, they um, in fact all are at least somewhat defective in virus replication in the PLSCR3 knockouts, perhaps suggesting that this could be a, um, a, a novel mechanism for all these viruses, the regulation of cardiolipin at least, um, in order to regulate virus replication or viral egress. So that's just a flavor of some future directions. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. Um, and I will thank my lab again. Um, I highlighted the work of Guishun Wang in the second part, which is really a cell biology and virology project in my lab. And then at the beginning, um, I highlighted the work of a graduate student, now graduated, Christina Zarek, who uh, was really working on our co-infection systems. But uh, they're supported by all these other wonderful people in my lab. We've had some great collaborators at UT Southwestern. And in particular, I'd like to um, acknowledge Dustin Hanks, and Robert Orchard for their help in the norovirus story and Laura Hooper for all her help in the um, uh, uh, LPM vitamin A co-infection story. Of course, I'll thank our funding as well. And um, you can connect with me on Twitter or if you're interested in uh, postdoc opportunities, please contact me. So I will stop here. And I think this is the awkward part where we just end. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Uh, I'm sure that everyone has a lot of questions because I think you opened the very basic kind of questions for us to look in immunology. And there is a good opportunity to ask all those questions on Twitter, X. So you just need to search for the account for Global Immunotalks and find the tweets that says, ask questions for Tiffany and ask them there. And she will reply to your questions when possible. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Tiffany. Again, thank you for everyone for listening. And we are also available on YouTube. So have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.